everyone. Welcome to the Designing Cities for All Student Book Club. Um, my name is Dimfi. I'm the head of program of Designing Cities for All, uh, the program of uh, the two-year program of Pakhuis de Zwijger, where we're going to uh, involve designers, scientists, experts, and everyone involved in city making uh, uh, to see uh, how can we create places where everyone feels like they belong. Um, so this is our student book club um, and um, I'm not here by myself. Here in the studio I also invited uh, our first Designing Cities for All fellow, which is Leongo Juliana. Hello, yeah, so good nice to see you again. Yes. We see you here often. Yes, nice to be here and uh, what a beautiful setting. Yeah, so I thought like it feels already so much like home here that we created a home, <laughs> making it a home. little bit, uh, make it a little bit cozy. Yeah, yeah and um, who we also have here because I, w I wish I could have invited you all here to the studio, but unfortunately that's not possible. Um, but you are here with us because uh, I can see you, cor if correct, on our screen, and that's where we can see our students that are joining the student book club. Can I see? Can I see them somewhere? Let's check. Yes. Yay! Hello! Hi! How is everyone doing? Good? Good? Great, um, because we have, we have seen uh, you, uh, you guys uh, before. Um, we had a meetup together, uh, I think three weeks ago. Um, Leongo, how did you experience that meetup? It, it, was, it was a really nice evening. Um, it was interesting also, I, I, the way you, you organized it and asked everyone to, to, to share something that makes them happy made us have such a different com conversation than you normally have in an introduction. So that, that's, that was an amazing idea and, and I really enjoyed it. And I, what a, the feedback we got, I think uh, yeah. the students also enjoy that. Um, and it's an important lesson to, to take along in, in, in life, you know, don't ask, hey, what, what's your job, but um, what is something that makes you happy? Then you have a total different conversation. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was really, really a good uh, Yeah, opening. I think we also got a lot of energy from, uh, from everyone yeah. because uh, all of you were uh, so enthusiastic and it was really nice that you also reached out to us afterwards. Uh, and that gave us a lot of uh, energy to organize this uh, second edition as well. And uh, what is also nice is that we have, uh, uh, because we got so much responses when we opened uh, the call for joining this student book, book club. And unfortunately, we weren't able to uh, select everyone that applied and uh, send them a copy of uh, uh, the book that we're going to discuss today, which is Soft City by David Sim, a book selected by, uh, by uh, Leongo. Um, but uh, for everyone, so what we decided was to uh, open this meetup for everyone and live stream it. Um, so if you're watching and uh, you have a copy of uh, Soft City, we hope you can learn something extra today. Um, if you don't have a copy yet and you would love to buy one, then uh, we have a nice good discount for you via our partner Ateneum Bookstore. Uh, if you use the code uh, DCFA. 2122 at the checkout, you get a 10% discount. So that's really nice. Um, and I think our students, they all have their copies ready because we've been reading uh, the book for the past three weeks. Uh, can the students wave with the, with the copies? I want to see them. Yeah, they all have Great. <laughs> Yay! I see everyone <laughs> is excited too. <laughs> well, uh, what what is reviewing uh, a book? Uh, we can do that with just uh, us. But how cool is it if we also have the author joining us? And that's why I'm really happy that he was able to join us uh, when we invited him. Um, so, uh, David, David Sim, are you there too? Yeah, hi there. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. It's great. Well, it's a great honor. I'm, I'm, I'm over the moon Thank you for <laughs> organizing this event. And I'm just really amazed that everybody wants to read the book. So that's fantastic. Yeah, we got a I'm lot of really, responses. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts and kind of maybe that will inspire the, ne the, next, the next edition of Soft City will be inspired by you guys. Yep. Um, and um, it was really nice that you uh, uh, 
uh, well, we've talked to you uh, before, and uh, you already said, like, okay, I'm really honored that uh, the students uh, are reading my book. And I think they also, we gave them a little bit of an assignment uh, mm -hmm. to fulfill as well, so we come back to that later. Um, so we would love to share their thoughts with you. Um, but first, we want to hear some of your thoughts, because you, we asked you to prepare a little bit of a presentation uh, yep. today. Uh, obviously, everyone read your book already, so they know it by heart. But uh, I Maybe. bet you could add something to that as well. So uh, I don't want to waste any more time and okay. uh, ask you. Well, and I, and I, I'm sorry if this screen. comes across being kind of a little bit like a kind of lecture kind of thing. But I, I really wanted to kind of share, like give you a little bit of the background to the book. And let's see, is this working? Yes, yes. And so this is my very quick, this would normally be like a one hour lecture. I'll try to do it in like eight minutes, but a little bit about the story of Soft City and what I was trying to do with the book. Um, what's a Soft City? This is um, my hometown of Malmö in Sweden. And I guess what's really unexpected or soft is that Swedish people dance tango on a spring evening. And that's really unexpected. People at different ages, different backgrounds, people that hang out in the same place. And not only do that, even the day, like people trust that their kids can go out and play and like um, sell juice to strangers. And of course, because they're Vikings, they can't help themselves jump in the sea. But what's cool is they walk around their neighborhood in their dressing gowns. And like, how, how soft is that when you meet your neighbor in their dressing gown? And even more soft is they leave the door open because the cat has to go out when they go out to go for their swim. And this is like in a city with a lot of challenges, crime and all those things. And so it's kind of like you imagine a country village and a newly built housing estate can work like that. And you're thinking maybe, okay, that's kind of a bit cute. You know, Swedish people dancing tango and dressing gowns, don't you know, we've got a lot of shit to deal with. You know, and Greta will tell you this, climate, We've got a pandemic of obesity. We've got a pandemic of loneliness, which is really ironic considering we're all living in cities. We have a crisis of inequity. We've got congestion. And most people, when they hear about urbanization, they're not enthusiastic. So I wanted to think about this idea more about a softer thing about neighborhoods and cities being based on relationships. And the idea that a place can connect you to like the street, the square, but it also connects you inside to outside. And when you're outside, you're more connected to the planet and also just to be connected to other people. So places, people and planet, and rather those things being like threats and kind of really scary, unpleasant things, these could be opportunities to connect. And so I guess the, the big overriding theme of the book is about these opportunities with small steps to connect, to get closer to planet, to society, and the place where you live. And actually, if you go back to Malmö, it's not just a place where people dance tango. It's actually where a very diverse group of people come together and share the public space. Now, these ladies at the front, they couldn't afford to live here in this newly built area, but they can still hang out in the public spaces. And the likelihood of societal connection is more, you know, is, is far greater if you can meet in the same spaces. And in this way, I think, you know, we can see the city as a kind of solution we, it can, because there are lots of different kinds of people with different economic backgrounds, different social, ethnic backgrounds, but if we can actually find ways to accommodate them in the same buildings, in the same places, we can maybe start to solve some of society's challenges and problems. And so there are three themes in the book. Um, one is about the building blocks. I think it's called building, blo building blocks is the chapter living locally. And I guess since the pandemic, this has become incredibly, um, incredibly pertinent because suddenly our world's got smaller. Now everybody in Paris is talking about the 15 minute city. And I guess you've heard about that, but I would say there's also the one minute, the three minute and the five minute city. And one of the ways we can do that, and this is one example of, of kind of how, how you can do things with the built form of the city to help you live locally, is this thing about enclosure. And it's a thing you get for free just by organizing the buildings in a certain way. You get this different protected space in the middle you get that free and you can do so much with that because that becomes your big garden. You can share it, your kids can play. And just by identifying this safe car free space, green space, it allows you know, the kids can in 45 seconds run outdoors to play, play with their friends in the courtyard 
while the moms and dads are inside cooking, everybody's looking at them. And it's just the way that the built form can make opportunities to allow us to live more enjoyable, more fun lives. And of course, if there's a, a different uh, acoustic space, it's quieter, you don't hear the traffic, you could sleep with an open window, you could hang your washing out, you know, your windows don't get dirty. You know, there's a good microclimate because it's protected from the wind. You know, and that's why now in, in Scandinavia, more and more we're building these kind of spaces. And perhaps more than anything, the enclosure gives a common space, which moves you against a sense of identity. It's a chance to come together, to know your neighbors and share something in common. And then that way we may start to solve some of the challenges facing society. That's one big thing, living locally. The next big theme is about, I would say it's about mobility. And I think when you talk about physical mobility, it's actually as much about social mobility. I call it getting about and getting on because it's getting about physically, but it's getting on and getting on with your life and also getting on with other people, being friends with other people. And it's just, this, again, just this thing about time and the way you're connected by through mobility and the fact that, you know, some movements in the city from inside to outside, it takes five seconds to go from the street to the courtyard, it takes maybe 15 seconds. And maybe from your apartment on the third floor, it takes you 45 seconds to get outside. And in the city of seconds, you can be really better connected to everything around you. And now this is a really weird picture because you think, what's this a picture of? And this is when me as an urbanist, I get really excited. What's the soft city? Well, this is an example of it. This is the continuous pavement in Copenhagen where the pavement, the sidewalk continues across the side street and, it's just, and it turns the street into a time machine. And it's a time machine because rather than you having to wait for the traffic to cross the street, you've got the right to walk straight across. So your five minute walk maybe becomes a three minute walk because you save time on every street corner. And for, when, when you've got, for people who have children, it means their children can walk to school on their own and having a much more adventurous childhood because they have that independence. But also the parents have got free time because they don't you know they can save an hour a day. And maybe time is the most precious thing we have because that's the real um, equalizer in society because everybody has the same amount of time to spend, regardless of how much money you've got, how much education you've got, you've only got 24 hours to spend. So this simple kind of solution saves you time and allows you to live in a more easier way in the city. And it's just some concrete slabs. It's just some cheap concrete slabs. You don't need an app to save time. And I guess Copenhagen, Amsterdam, who's the best at cycling? <sighs> Hard question. But cycling in the city is just so space efficient. But not only is it an efficient way to get around, it connects you to stuff. If you want to have like a, to buy some Danish pastry, you know, it takes you like 10 seconds to stop. You know, you smell, you smell the bread, you smell the coffee, you can jump off your bike, you can be inside the shop and out again within a minute. And so really fast, you can be connected. And in this way, walking and cycling and shopkeeping, all of those things make a kind of ecosystem of, of the city. Everything's interconnected with small steps. And it's the same thing when you're waiting for the tram or waiting for the bus. What can you do in that minute, those two minutes while you're waiting? If you're in Hamburg, you can have a beer while you're waiting, you know, and then what happens when you get on the bus? You can have these encounters with people that are different from you. And we can talk about TOD. There's books about building towers next to bus stops because we've got to have more efficient transport. But what we really need is to be better connected to where we are, to be more connected to our neighborhoods. Finally, the big one, the Greta one about climate change. Can we live? Can we get closer to the weather? Can we live with the weather? Um, and this is a really simple example. This is a wall. It's a wall. It's a stone wall which protects people from the wind. And that means that in Sweden, in February, you can sit outside if the sun's shining and if you're protected from the wind, you can almost sunbathe. And in this way, we can actually make our own weather. And I guess the Netherlands is kind of a bit like the Scandinavia. It's windy, it can be cold. This is my, in Lund in Sweden, it's a corner of a medieval square. And they were so smart in medieval times, you could make this kind of 
fantastic cozy corner where you could sunbathe because the weather was so nice. But the amazing thing is, even in winter, when there's snow on the ground, you can still sit outside. But we can actually make our own weather and then we can do things to connect us better. We can make aerodynamic roof spaces. We can better protect, we can better ventilate. And with really cheap additions, we can make our homes and our buildings more comfortable with shades and shutters, with balconies and lodges that can connect us. And again, this is really quite cheap stuff, which allows us to live outdoors more, be more connected with outside, feel, feel the weather. And finally, this is from the end of the book. This is Bern in Switzerland, like the Swiss capital. And who would imagine all the bankers and I don't know, politicians would walk around the city in the summer in their swimming costumes. And there's maybe a dangerously high speedo count here, I don't know. But what's amazing is that the people here can swim in the river. And more and more, we call this mediterranization, when we're getting these very, very hot summers in the middle of Europe. You used to, what you used to get in, in the south of Italy and Spain, we're now getting in Switzerland, Germany, maybe even creeping, and creeping into the Netherlands. And what it means to be able to jump into your river in the middle of your city, to have a swim to cool down. And just by having some simple wooden steps, you can be connect, uh, sorry, some concrete steps, you can get in and out easily, a red painted handle. But this swimming phenomenon is much bigger than that because it makes you aware of climate change. Like, wow, it's June and it's already warm enough. Yeah, climate change or it's August and the water's really cold. Yeah, the glacier is melting up in the mountain. This experience of swimming in the river actually connects us back to the big question of climate change. So all of these things, I guess, in the book, it's about being connected in the dense, diverse environment of a city. It can actually be delightful if you're just a little bit thoughtful. So that's a kind of a little introduction to the book about how we can find a human scale and that even in that heavy, hard city, because a city sounds like a hard thing, it can actually be soft if you have the human dimension. So that was my introduction. I'll stop the screen sharing and let's see if there are any questions. And we're like, was that too much of a lecture? No, I think it was a great summary of uh, some things that we've read uh, in the book. And it was a great okay. reminder for us that, uh, that maybe uh, flipped through some pages and saw so many colorful examples and uh, to have it like, you know, get a, get a great overview uh, again. Um, David, you've been working as an uh, architect, planner, a practitioner for uh, many years now. Uh, you are working as a creative director at uh, uh, Gale in Copenhagen. Um, what inspired you to write the book? Why did you feel the need to, to bring your knowledge together on paper? Well, I guess, I mean, it was, um, I mean, you've, I'm not a writer, I'm a practitioner. So it was quite hard to write the book. What I found was every, I felt what shocked me was in my life, so much of my time is spent on convincing others to make a better, better decisions. That's the main thing I do is just trying to persuade people to do things a bit better. So that would be and your clients? Just, yeah, like clients, because clients are doing projects and you're saying like, please don't build towers, please make it lower. I promise you it'll be better. And I found every time I met a new client, I was telling them the same things. And some of them, seems so simple like this thing like the enclosure and explaining the ground floor is different from the top floor and it's like that this is so simple do i need to even explain this but actually i did and so the joke in the office was the working title of the book was the shit that works and basically it's all of this simple stuff that we kind of know works and i think anybody who's in the industry or works like yeah actually that that makes sense that works and to gather it together. And I guess we couldn't call it the shit that works. That's not a very good way to sell a book. But I guess I was kind of reacting a little bit to smart city. Like everything was smart mm. and it could be really high tech. And as long as you've got the app, it'll be great. And so I thought, well, is there something else which is actually not technology? Yeah, because I know you, you feel like smart city is not always smart. Yeah, well, sometimes it's really dumb, but <laughs> but um, no, but it's just like this thing of you need to know the technology, you need to have the app, you need to like, and especially I thought, I mean, where the real urbanization is happening is not 
you know, in the Netherlands or Sweden or Denmark. It's in the, you know, in the, in the developing countries. And should, all, should they have to buy all of this expensive technology, you know, when so many things are really simple, mm -hmm. you know, like, like having bikes, like cycling, you know, or having a, 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 an extra pavement across the side street so you don't need traffic lights mm -hmm. for, for pedestrians. And I felt there were so many really simple things, which were actually quite human. Um, and so the, the, I guess the softness is also human, like soft, like the human body. Um, so that was kind of where, where it started. Um, the original book was much longer because I didn't know how to write a book. So I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Everything you knew. And then, <laughs> and then, and then an editor, editor like had to take it all out and then they packaged it. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm also interested to hear, I mean, from the students, the things that they think, wow, I wish you'd written more about that or wow, there was just like way too much about the enclosure. I mean, right. I don't know. Well, that's a question we can uh, we can ask them in a minute, yeah. because Leonga, you're an architect too. Do you recognize the uh, things that David is saying? That, like, I was reading it too, and and I thought like, okay, this actually makes so much sense. It's so logic logical, but apparently it isn't. No, it, what what is David is saying? I can only affirm that that when you're talking to the client, or you know, you're talking to a neighborhood. We have a tendency to think in exclusion, to, to solve problems, mm. in, 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 in putting things in, in, in silos uh, and thinking that that will solve things. Um, and I think the, the, the important lesson that we have learned of uh, urbanization in, you know, in the 50s and the 60s um, is that actually if to build a city it's about connecting people, it's about connecting all these uh, contradictory of the city, mm -hmm. connecting them to each other, and 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 there comes the like like the the well the challenging part of this field of work is that basically as as the architect, as the designer, as the urban designer, you are one of the few people at the table that is capable of connecting contradictory elements with each other. So all the others at the table are thinking in these silos and thinking to solve just elements by themselves without looking at the total picture. And, and that is basically what has happened um, in, uh, in our cities. If you look at older cities, um, you see these things interconnected. And of course, we had a difficult period when we had the industrialization, sorry, mm. that's a difficult word, <laughs> um, that, that, that we had the, 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 the factories in the cities, and then we get all this, the, 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 the um, say the smell and, and, and those things, you know, the bad, bad parts of that. And then, then we thought, okay, let's split everything uh, and, and put everything uh, in, in, a, in a selected area. And what we have learned now from that is that that is not working. And that creates these cities that you are car dependent and that you have only connection with the people that do the same that you do. Because if you go, where you live, it's only living so you will never meet someone that has been working. And when everybody's going to work, there's no one there. So, um, and, and that is the, the interesting part for this book. And, and as I've, I've said it before, it, for me, it was an aha moment. Mm. And that's why I put it on the list. And I think, hey, everybody should read this. Because um, when I was taught about urban design, we didn't talk about this. And, and that is what, 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 what we miss. It's, it's, it's about people. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting people. And once you... And you ha have to learn the tools. How do you create a physical environment? So with hard things, you create the softness to yeah. make that connection. And that is, that is the challenge. I think that is also a different way of looking at cities. Because like, da like David is mentioning, that a, a city is actually a system of relationships. Mm -hmm. relationships. And um, uh, maybe it's also nice because I know there is a question from one of the students that relates to this as well. Um, so maybe it is time to move a little bit to the students because I bet they have questions too. And there is a question from uh, Kristen because Kristen has a question about uh, the, our society that's getting more uh, individualized. So when we talk about relationships. Hi, Kristen. Hi. If correct, Hi. we can hear you. Hi. Could yes. you ask your question? Yes. Uh, hi, David. So. Um, oh, we can hear you yet. Oh. Yeah, we can now. Yes. 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 
Okay, that's nice. Uh, hi, David. Uh, so I had a question because um, uh, you said that um, places can connect you to other people and that urban design uh, can create communities, but um, to what extent do you take into account the increasingly individualized society uh, when creating a soft city? Well, that's a really, really great question, but um, you, you're really touching on something. I think that individualization goes on so many levels. It starts with the professionals. Like, I, I mean, I was thinking we had a very nice conversation last week about, about music and um, I mean, the way it works. I guess a lot of architects are kind of like rock stars are doing their like their solo kind of performance. And I think my role is much more like a conductor, getting everybody to play together. And on, 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 on the design level, it's kind of getting everybody designed. But um, the, way, the way my old boss, Jan Gale, talked about how a city should be, you have to think about running a city is like kind of like having a party. You have to really be, take care of your guests. You have to make them comfortable, give them a place to sit, to stay, and be constantly aware of what the mood is like. You know, sometimes you turn the music up, sometimes you turn the music down. You know, so, you know, sometimes you know you, you do different things. So I think this being observant, it's not the same all the time. Is is maybe something. So there's not like one size, one solution. It's kind of really dynamic, and in that way, and I think there's something that you're very good at in the Netherlands because you don't have so much space. You often use the same space for different things. So like a market could be a, a car park, and it could be a fun fair. I mean, the same space could be used for different things. And that makes people aware of, or of the difference. But th those are the background things of, I think of, I mean, I think of in their professional terms. In terms of individualism, it's really hard, especially now with the pandemic, because people are really encouraged, like, be alone, my own space, my own car. So what we have to do is I don't think, I don't think we can force anyone to do anything. But kind of like the party thing, we can make invitations. Mm -hmm. We can make an invitation that while you're waiting for their bus, you know, you can sit down and maybe it's easy to talk to someone. Maybe you can arrange the benches rather than the bench being like this. You can maybe put the benches like in an L shape. And so you kind of can see the face of the other person that's waiting. And you can make these little, little tiny invitations or put the bench where there's sunshine and people might sit on it, you know, because the sun's shining. And so can we create these tiny opportunities which make us feel comfortable together? Um, and I think what okay, a challenge, for example, in the Netherlands is you have a lot of row houses. Everybody has their own house, which is hard, it's kind of individualistic, but that means everybody has their own front door and everybody has their own front step. So you can turn the individual thing into something, I don't know, that invites for, um, for a connection. So the, 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 the way you design the window or the, the, the step on the front of the house, that can invite you to sit and stay. And if people are comfortable, and I think for me, one of the things I really remember from the first times I came to the Netherlands were these stoops on the houses. And people would sit on them because they feel comfortable. And if you feel comfortable in your own place, you, um, you, can, um, you can feel me more open to connection. So I'm sorry, that was a very long answer. Um, you made me think about many different things. So I promise the next answer will be shorter. But, um, and, you can, and you can also tell me if I'm wrong. Did I get it? Or Was or your do, question or, yeah, answered? What, what, do you, what do you think? What do you think the answer is? Uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, if you're comfortable in your own place and in, in your own neighborhood, I think that um, connections with other people come spontaneously and like the design can help very much with it, indeed, yes. Well, if, I, if I just add something, my, my, my favorite one at the moment, I've been talking a lot because I, I want to build lower buildings and having the staircase, there are three or floors, and it's very healthy to take the stairs, but we've had this big thing with Corona about using the elevator, using the lift. And that's become like Russian roulette taking the elevator because you press <laughs> the button and the button's dirty and the whole box is just filled with Corona. And the worst thing is if you have to share the elevator with a stranger <laughs> and people like really feel antisocial, the, 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 the elevator, the lift, it heightens the antisocial feeling. And if the door opens like, no, 
I'm not getting in with you, kind of. Or if you're in the lift, the door opens, like, no, I don't want you to get in beside me. Kind of. it's, whereas if you have like the staircase, you can kind of negotiate, say, okay, I'm coming through, you know, or, or the old lady's coming up, okay, I'll, I'll wait, you keep going. And you can do this little ballet in the staircase. And so I think you can look around in your environment and you can find, hey, that works well. That, create, that, 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 that detail creates sociability. This other detail makes it difficult to be sociable. And I'm sure there are like thousands of other examples of that. Amazing. Yeah. Leongo, you want to add something to that, right? Yes, I think, I think what we have to realize is that loneliness is, is an epidemic. And, and, and so you can, it, 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 it's a given that this indiv individualized society has a, a side effect. And so we have to consciously react on that and try to, to you cannot force people, but like David is saying, you know, create the possibility of that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what we, we tend to forget, if, if we look at public space as a place where, you know, some, we, we want to create benches where people cannot lay on. You know, they can only sit and sit upright. But what is nicer than to lay in a park on a bench? I mean, so um, we have been trying to avoid people to interconnect. You know, if we talk about people standing on the corner of the street, we say, yeah, that's Hangyong, that's people, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, it's, it's, we have to create a different um, a mindset when we are approaching uh, the design of cities. Mm -hmm. I think, thank you so much, Kirsten, for your question. I think I also have a question from someone that is a little bit related to this, uh, because it, it is about people, and it's Schuert. Schuert, you yes. have a question about diversity. I was reading a book, and um, the book was talking about how uh, we should take the diversity of people into consideration. And I was thinking, uh, what if those people have uh, opposing needs. Let's say you have students living together with the elderly and the students want to party. I mean, they're students. So in what way can we account for this or make it inclusive for more than one group of people? It's, it's, a, really good, it's a really good question. Um, generally, maybe the students and the old people are, that can be okay because often the old people are more deaf. So that can, it can be a good combination. I mean, I mean, I mean joking in a way, but it's, sometimes it's surprising that you can bring different people together. I, I think there are some basic things about negotiating the meeting between people. And so you can see the advantage because a lot, I mean, obviously maybe the old people are amongst the loneliest people. Um, and it's true that often like, you'll get the situation, yeah, old people, they complain because the young people are drinking beer late at night and making a noise. But that's also maybe because they feel a bit left out. Um, I mean, generally, I mean, they're not as stressed. Like, I mean, people who are working and have got kids and babies, that's a bigger problem if the neighbors are really noisy. Um, but I think there's something about creating an environment where you kind of get to meet each other and you're aware of each other. If you've got like a, a smaller entity, so for example, a traditional building with an apartment building with four floors or something, there are maybe eight, 12 families or households around the stair. And then you kind of, everybody knows each other. It's not so anonymous. And okay, there's the student apartment on the second floor. Oh yeah, we know them. And there's the old lady on the third floor. And there's the, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the lady, the single mom with the two boys that play football because of the mud on the stair, you can see them. And if there's a kind of a scale where everybody knows each other, it's easier to kind of negotiate those small conflicts. And sometimes the group, if you've got like a, a household group of like eight, 12 households, it's easier. The group dynamic can be better than it's just like you and an immediate neighbor, because then just, you just really hate the one next door. So there's something about creating a dynamic where it goes together. There's also something about making people remember that it's not static. Like your life doesn't stand still. Mm. You know, like um, the old people were young once. The students, when they're doing the exams and they have to study, they, they kind of like it to be quiet as well. And it's about having this kind of conversation where you kind of recognize, well, actually, you know, we all, we all have different needs at different times, different times of the day, different times of the week, um, different, different times of our lives. But it's kind of, how can we create a dialogue where you understand those things? And it comes down to, I think, making opportunities where you can meet. And you meet, whether it's on the stair, at the front step, 
like you kind of can meet your neighbors in the courtyard. You know, I think that that, that, that would really help a lot. And also designing dwellings that they have a quieter side and a, bit, a noisier side. So, I mean, the way, it, the way it kind of survives in Copenhagen is we have the courtyard, which is generally quiet, and we have the street, which is generally kind of noisy. And it's kind of pretty much like you can do what you like in the street, but in the courtyard, you have to be a bit more respectful, like not making noise after 11 o'clock or something, I don't know where. And so I think it's um, the environment of meeting people and like knowing your neighbors, and then you're more likely to, re to respect them if you know them, because it's kind of, it makes kind of sense. And then giving like these little rooms for maneuver, like having a, a place where noisiness is more permissible and quietness is not. In the modernistic city, there's often not a front and a back, or maybe my front is your back. And that, that, that makes it more difficult to kind of have common ground. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think I also read in, in your book the, to those points, which I found really, really nice. It's just, the thing in my head it popped in like it should be available to everyone like the Baugemeinschaft I think it was called I think you do need quite some like a high income to have that like, I mean yeah. for all of us probably it will be hard to get housing or get, yeah. get a Baugemeinschaft uh, yeah. building or group but, but, but what's interesting that, that's is, is I think about, a bigger I mean, story a really, maybe okay you're on to a really important subject now this is really good because affordability like the affordability of the city and that's also like I mean we have these different kinds of like a city for all and we've got this challenge of different ages. We've got this challenge of different ethnicities, but income is also really significant. Mm -hmm. And now we have a whole generation growing up who maybe cannot afford, like maybe live in the city, the, your student years is the only time you can live in the city because it becomes so expensive afterwards. Um, what was interesting about the German model, I mean, and, and I don't think it's perfect, but they recognized 20 years ago that the, the prices were going up and so the idea of finding ways to make it more affordable and it's still maybe not cheap, but having a different ownership model and maybe less speculative, because I mean, we have a huge problem, especially in Western society, because people, people's home is not just their home, it's also their kind of life investment and their pension. And there's kind of a vested interest that you want it to be more valuable because you get this more money, but we need some more models where homes are cheaper and affordable and maybe you cannot speculate with them in the same way and that's again maybe we need to design better software like yeah. better ownership models better financing models david is this also the reason why soft cities are uh not that well implemented yet i'm actually like asking one of the questions for one of the students and maybe he can join us because it's flores uh flores uh, flores has a question about actually why not? Uh, Flores, what was your question? Yeah, hi, hi David. Hi, um, hi. hi everyone. Um, yeah, my question is basically because these ideas of you seem so great and it feels like we would all want to live in a soft city. Um, but then again, if, if I look around on and see new developments, for example, here in Amsterdam, they're often not soft. So what's going on there and how could someone like me who is studying uh, urban planning uh, in the future work to steer developers etc all the people towards a more soft city yeah what needs to be but, different i mean it's, 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 it's a really, again another really great question i mean and this is what i'm asking myself constantly because i thought well you know this is so obvious why don't we do this and there are so many other mechanisms i guess one problem is that most creative people are really concerned with like building the physical environment. Like how can we make it nice with a nice front door and a bench, a little garden. And we think about those things, but we need to spend more creative energy on designing better legal systems, better financing systems. Um, because I mean, as soon as you want to talk about the money, like, like I fall asleep because I, it's so boring, but we need to understand those things because I, I mean, uh, what I tried to, find was all these things in soft cities should be cheap things. This is not expensive solutions. These are cheap solutions. So why are we not doing the cheap things? And there's lots of reasons. It could be like lousy education. I don't know, maybe different vested interests in the, in the, in the, in politics, or um, I guess there's thing about oversimplification. Often in politics, a lot of decisions about planning are made in politics and they want things fast. And so, okay, we need to get 
you know, a thousand new apartments in one year. And they'll do it the fastest possible way and maybe don't look for a qualitative solution. And then people assume, oh no, we can't afford quality because we have to do it cheap. And again, it's like saying, well, maybe if we spend a little bit more time on the design process, mm. both in terms of making it work better, but also communicating with everybody in the process, maybe we'll actually save money that way yeah. than doing this fast, more industrial solution. Yeah, I think this is actually something we've heard before when talking to people about uh, this, like invest more time and money in the design process beforehand, right? And yeah. include people. And I, I, I also think it's, um, we have this challenge of um, having developers that are kind of hit and run. I mean, they develop, they sell, they make their profit and they're gone. And actually what I just came up with is like, why don't we, you know, make them have a, a maintenance obligation for like 15 years, um, you know, so that if you develop this, this, this area and it gets social problems, because what happens now, the social problems are for the, for the municipality. Um, so the developer is, can, can make his profit really fast and goes to the next project. Why don't we make them partly also responsible for the quality of life? Because the quality uh, David is talking about in his book, those are qualities that are not measured in an Excel sheet. They are measured after like 10 years that that, that neighborhood has been functioning and you see that interaction between the people and suddenly you have people that, that live a much happier life, can mm. grow. Yeah, it's different kind of data. It, it's a different kind of data that you, have to, that you have to gather and also a different kind of responsibility, not just after you, you have so, sold all the, 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 the apartments, but your, your responsibility continues because it's not fair to throw all these problems on, on the municipality. Mm. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're on something here because maybe this is the next subject. I don't know if it's me writing the book, but there's something almost about like soft, soft governance or soft financing. Like we need a different model because this hard, um, and it's especially strong Anglo-American fast money culture. Like everything's about making money now in this three year period. Uh, I mean, for me, one of the most disappointing projects I had, we were working for a big Danish pension fund. And it's all fantastic. The pension fund is the perfect client because they've got a perspective of like 30 years. Mm. And I thought that that's great. But what I discovered was the guy who was the manager of the pension fund, he had like a three year career trajectory and he wanted his curve to go like this in the first three years and then he'd move on to another job. And of course we need like the investment to go like, you know, get better and better, like, you know, and then when I retire and in 30 years when I retire, that's when the real value is there. Yeah. I think that is the way we things. have to design anyway, right? Not just for our own lifespan, but also that one of our children and our children's yeah. children and even after, afterwards, especially yeah. if you're talking about things like uh, climate change or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, time is going really fast and I bet there are some more questions and uh, the students can uh, ask some more questions uh, at the end. But what we also asked them is um, we uh, gave them a little bit, a little bit of an assignment <laughs> and I see a really excited uh, face uh, <laughs> on David's uh, uh, Zoom um, because what we asked our students was to uh, take a picture of something that is great or is not that great and remind you of a soft city phenomenon in your neighborhood. So take a stroll, take a picture and we got a lot of pictures back and we selected a few that we want to show you and we want to uh, ask the students or invite the students that sent the picture to give you a little bit of an explanation so we d can discuss it a little bit. Um, um, and first, I would like to invite Demi. Hey, Demi, because you sent us a picture of your grandmother. Yes, I sent a picture of uh, the like apartment building or like the building she lives in. Yeah, well, we're going to show it on the screen and then you can continue talking. Yeah, so this is the building she lives in. It's predominantly like elderly people, so 55 and up um, are able to live here. Um, and they all um, like share, they have their own personal balconies on the outside and on the inside, uh, they have like this corridor where they all walk uh, and they have events there. Um, so there's a lot of personal connection there as well. And oh. at the bottom, you kind of see it in the picture a little bit. Um, they have a lot of like plants and trees and kind of like a mini park, I would say, um, where they're all invited to kind of have a little bit of outdoor space, 
um, enjoy the, the great weather, meet each other. There's a little fountain there as well to really uh, oh. stimulate them to get together, have a little walk. Um, yeah, so I thought it was really nice and it really reminded me of the, um, the courtyard idea. Yeah, uh, in the I think that, that's really, really beautiful. And I think it does everything at once because it's connecting people to a sense of place, which really gives them a common identity. Um, it's helping them to go outside just to be in the, in the light and have to be connected with sort of uh, natural phenomenon. And I suppose probably the most important thing is, is being connected to other people like their neighbors. And you know, that, that's, that's really, really nice example. And for me, like, I guess if we were kind of architectural snobs, we say, yeah, but those pastel colors, you know, and I don't like the shape, but actually those things don't matter when the people things work, the, 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 the aesthetics are maybe less important. Mm. That's really nice. They mean, so you, you could, could you imagine living there when you're old? Yeah, I just want to ask, is your, is your grandmother happy there? She likes she it? Is. Yeah, she is because she has a lot of she's she was able to meet so many like people there um, and have common interests. They have like even like a choir in their own cafeteria there where they have like yeah. events and they host game nights. So it's it's a really like it's a community there, um, which, of course, when you're older and when your family might not visit every single day, it's nice to have um, your own little family there. Yeah, so, uh, it's great. No, that's really good, and I think it's an incredibly relevant example because we're 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 living in a enough enough in a rapidly aging society, and also I mean uh, as as Leongo said about the the loneliness is such a big problem, and I I would say in a way maybe we need this kind of development for all all level society, maybe not just for old people. Yeah, Leongo, I see you nodding a lot. Yeah. Yes, I, I I like the example. I, I love it. Because I thought I, let's start with a happy example. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, from the moment I, I was visiting my, my, my grandparents, which is 25 years ago, uh, in, in, this, in this block, and, 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 yeah, I said, you know, you must be able to do this in a different way. I, I think this is a great example yeah. um, because of the possibility of interconnecting. You know, if you want the privacy of your own space, you can close your door. If you want to connect, you can just open your door and the connection is there. So, um, yeah, it's a great example. Okay. Well, let's do another one then. It almost okay. looks like it's like a game show, right? <laughs> another <laughs> example. This is I love this. Okay, for all the way from Rotterdam. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia. Yes, hi. Um, hi, Cynthia. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Amy, by the way, for your example. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a great example. Uh, well, I don't know if my picture is showing, but I am originally from Lima, from Peru, but I'm living right now in Rotterdam. And this is straight in Groningen, pretty near my university. And it's just that you're walking around the neighborhood and suddenly you see that in the middle of the street it starts to be pedestrian. And it seems like a place that the neighbors are hanging out because in the middle of the, of the street, there is a table with chairs and people have like a kind of allotment gardens around there so i thought that it was a fantastic a fantastic surprise in the neighborhood yeah so it's local residents that like claimed the public space in front of the door and put yeah. uh, benches there and everything I, I don't know if it's uh, an initiative from the neighborhoods but it seems like because the other streets are not like that yeah uh, it's it's just a random a random thing there but I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. And do you think it's public space or is it private space? No, I think it's public space. Do you feel invited as well? Yeah, I usually walk. I, I mean, when I'm going to buy stuff, I usually walk to that street specifically because it's pedestrian. I think it's lovely. I have never, I mean, I have never used the chair or the table, uh, but, I, but I think that it invites you to walk through mm. it. You know. David? No, I think that that's, that's a, it's a great example. Also, I think it's interesting, and especially with somebody coming from another culture, um, coming from uh, Latin America, coming to the to Europe, and that actually you find something which I think we all agree with. It's not like, and, I, and I'm, I'm very fascinated that what, what, as human beings, we have in common, regardless of our culture, we find similar things, because I felt very nervous. I mean, the book, the book is now being translated to other languages. Mm. 
And so it's being translated to Mongolian and to Chinese. And I, well, you know, does this make sense in another culture? Does the, Did the you add new examples? Um, no, I wasn't allowed to. Oh, so, so it's uh, all European examples. Yeah, and so it's, it's very, very European. And so I wondered, is the, I mean, is the soft city relevant in Latin America? Mm. Well, Leongo, you have experience in other parts of the world. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the, the challenges in Latin America are, 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 are I'm, I, th I would say, more severe about reclaiming public space. Mm. I mean, it's first of all reclaiming it because of safety. Um, the public space. I mean, if I can take um, um, Colombia as an example, that that you know that that there was a process of reclaiming the public space because people were uh, trying to avoid the public space because of safety reasons. Um, but um, the necessity of people is is, is the same. Is that interconnection? I'm, I think it's maybe even stronger in in Latin America to interconnect with others. Uh, then, then it is. Uh, I mean, that's something that that is still very, very much uh, present in 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 Latin America. Um, that and and uh, uh, you know, people are less less in individualized in in Latin America. I mean, the family, the, the interconnection between between within family, but also within other families, is very important. So, um, I I think it's it, it's it's a good book for anywhere in the mm. world. I mean. Ah, and maybe this is a good idea to have local readers send in pictures like yes, we're doing so right that now, would right? Be good. good. <laughs> but I think it's also interesting because um, Cynthia, as an outsider, also if she's like, you know, this, we've, we talked before about the in betweenness. You know, when you come mm. from outside, you see maybe you're more sensitive. And do you see more? Do you notice more things? Do you notice both differences, but also things that are the same? So I think it's also interesting. I don't know. Um, I mean, Cynthia, if you want to add, do you think you see the city differently than your, your Dutch friends? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I see them differently from my Dutch friends. Of course, I appreciate a lot of things that Rotterdam has to offer the city. Uh, especially, uh, I, I agree with Leongo's um, comment about how the reclaim of public space in Latin America is becoming so strong lately. and. And I have seen these kind of patterns around neighborhoods that are maybe low income class that they usually do gather a lot on public space or on the street, but because they have to, I mean, their houses are not in that conditions to actually gather a lot of people. So they usually use public space uh, as a way to reclaiming and to gather, and, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't talk about uh, my perspective in contrast to the Dutch perspective, but uh, I think it's a great city in many sense. It has a lot to offer. Of course, every city is a process, so you can always get better. Um, yeah, but I, I really like it, and I appreciate those little things that, that are just in the city that are fantastic. Mm. Leongo, you want to add something to that? Yeah, well, we, we have this tendency, um, I think, uh, specifically, it's, it's maybe stronger in the Caribbean, Latin America is to di distinguish ourselves by exclusion uh, and create these uh, gated communities. Um, and and that, is, that is something that you have to counter. Because um, people think that they are safer in these gated communities. And my comment is always, if we create all these gated communities next to each other, there's a moment you have to travel from one gated area to the next gated mm. area. And what happens in between? And who is taking care of the in-between space? And, and I think that is something that they have realized, for instance, in, in, in Medellin, Colombia, to, to, hey, we have to take care of this in-between space, in this space between the one area and the other, because if we don't, life is not so pleasant. I mean, and who is responsible? I think we all are responsible. I think we all are responsible. And, and, and it's, it's about um, me, every urbanization plan I do in the Caribbean, this uh, this aspect of um, uh, gate, a gated community comes along. And, and we have hired a professional uh, security mm. uh, company to explain that a gated community is not safer than a non-gated community. Mm. Because this, this is just, this is a, 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 it's a story, it's not true. Uh, but we all feel that it, that, it, that it gives you safety. But the safety is when you have this interconnection between humans, when you meet, when you can see each other. Because behind, people want to wall their, yeah. their, their area, but you don't see what happens behind the wall. 
So, but if, the, if you have a transparent uh, uh, um, distinction between one area and the other, you can see what happens. Yeah. And it creates safety on both sides. Yeah. And as we see now, you can facilitate that in different ways yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia, thank you for your uh, example. David, are you ready for another one? Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> Hit B. Now, I, I was just going to add this then what we're talking about now is this idea of persuading people to step outside of their comfort zone. Mm. And I think we're selling, I mean, there's a lot of people selling this comfort, selling security. So, you know, I, I, mean, and I, I mean, a big thing has happened now, I guess, Jan Gale talks the 20th century, where so much of life was privatized. And so like, I mean, a hundred years ago, you had to go outside because you had to go to the toilet outside, you had to get water. You didn't have a fridge, you had to buy food three times and four times a day. Um, and, and over the 20th century, everything moved inside. You know, with heating and hot water. I mean, now we've got like cinema at home. We've got like our espresso machine at home. So we don't have reasons to go outside. So we need to have reasons. We need to find new reasons to go outside. Yeah, and make relationships. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Mm. So let's have another example. Yeah. Um, I want to invite, uh, let's see, Julia. Julia, you brought an example as well. Hi. Yes, hello. Um, do I have to share it? No, we're going to share it on the screen. So you just uh, explain uh, what we see here. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a neighborhood close by. It's called Northwest. And it's like in the Netherlands, you have all these Phoenix Weige, And this is an older one. Um, and I came here to Wageningen like uh, three years ago. and. I always thought it was a really strange neighborhood and I didn't like to go there. But uh, due to Corona, I went on more walks there. And actually, there are a lot of hidden spots. So you have playgrounds where a lot of people come and everybody actually has their garden on the front. And they also use these spaces and put, uh, yeah, like chairs or uh, the, the bookshelves the, where you can pick books. And now it's a really nice place to go, but before I didn't notice these things. So it's very livable and actually quite, yeah, like the soft city, I think. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's really beautiful. Also, I'd say your experience is exactly the same as mine because what's happened in the pandemic, we've slowed down. Everybody's been living more locally and I think that that's been, and I, and I've been doing these walks because just to keep sane, I do a walk every day in the neighborhood and I've discovered like places I've never been before. And also those places that kind of look like nothing. It's just like a table and a bench. I saw what was nice was there was like the little, like the hill with the, with the slide. And I guess there's a situation where the adults can sit down and have a coffee or a beer and your kid can play. And so you can actually do like multitask in a way you can actually have a conversation with a friend and your kid can play safely in a, in a kind of fun environment because it wasn't like a a totally designed play area it was a little bit natural as well but what was really great was it was incredibly modest it wasn't like wow this is amazing design it was actually almost invisible design you could say but it's actually a really great place to live because it allows you know different people to get together outside kind of children can play adults can sit under the tree then you you can see the people in their gardens you could wave and it's of course you could say it's totally banal but most of everyday life is actually made up of these little banal moments but if they're nice life is nicer so i, I think it's a really great example mm. but does that also mean that it's it's because we got more creative that we suddenly see and make use of these spots? Or should we as designers interact more on that? Um, well, I guess that place worked already before the pandemic, but we didn't notice it. Yeah, we, ah, we so it was know. Julia. No, no, no. So, no, but, no but, Julie, but Julie didn't notice it because you know, it's like, those, I think it's maybe the slowing down. I mean, what really amazes me about the pandemic, I mean, I was flying everywhere. I was like flying every week. Like every month I was on a different continent. And I was suddenly for one year, I've been in my, my neighborhood for one year. And it's a really strange kind of change. But I would say I feel, although I'm, my life is much slower, um, I feel I'm experiencing 
uh, my world is much smaller. I feel I've got more time, although it's going slower. And I feel, although I'm going less places, I'm experiencing more. And I think this is maybe going to be really interesting to what people think will happen after the pandemic, because I think our behavior is going to change. And this local life is actually going to be much more significant because we can understand, actually, I can have nice experiences. Mm. I don't need to spend so much money because actually having beers in the, on, the, on the grass with my friends it's just as nice as going into Amsterdam to have expensive beers. Yeah, well, and hospitality I time is closed, well. so we have to, yeah. You know, and I save time, I save money, I save time, and I save energy. You know, and so, like, why would I travel so much, for, yeah. you know, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure you've got experiences, too, of this, like, this pandemic change in the world. Yeah. Time is running fast. I want to go to one last example, and it's from Salman. And Salman, you have to. Uh, do you have some extra light in your room because we can't see you right now? Um, but we're going to uh, show yeah, your picture on the screen, um, and, and maybe I can give some uh, uh, insights already, and then you can take over because it's a place in Amsterdam called Overtoom, and we picked this mm -hmm. example because it was actually uh, more of a. Uh, picked, well, it's a place that maybe needs some extra love and maybe we can come up with some extra uh, examples together what we could do here. Because Salman, wh why did you chose this picture? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Um, well, it's around the corner of my house. And what I noticed is that there is a lot of space. It's a very wide street. But um, I struggle very often uh, getting to the other side. And it strikes me, well, that first of all, but also because there is an elderly home around the corner, it's right behind. And I often see elderly walking, uh, and then there, I actually talked to one of them and they were thinking of whether to cross here or go all the way to the end and then uh, walk uh, over the zebra crossing. So it was, they didn't really feel safe uh, and that really sparked my interest. So my question to you would be, how are we going to change this? What soft elements do you envision here? In this, yeah, uh, well, I, I, I think you, you probably know some already. I think it's, it's a really good story. And I'm really impressed that you can combine like a physical, like a, a real place, but the, 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 the little interview with, of the human experience. Because you can say, I mean, and again, it'd be very easy to dismiss this. Okay, it's been some, some old lady, an old man, but for an old person, doing that extra like long walk to cross the street that's a really a lot of their valuable energy that they have to use to do that very uninteresting experience so i think um it's what's good is as you've identified it's a wide street there's already a lot of space so it's not like there's not enough space also the buildings were not so high so it wasn't skyscrapers so the scale was nice but the shocking thing was so much space was given to transportation. Um, I guess it was the tram tracks in the middle. And I don't know if the tram tracks is shared with the car. Sometimes you share, sometimes it's only the tram. Yeah, it's shared. Yeah, and so, and so you- Oh, wait, I mean, not this nice one, but there are no, both no, cars not. and trams, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's separated next to each other. Okay, so, cause I mean, I mean, there's things you could do maybe, I mean, sometimes you can put this grass down on the middle which makes it softer mm. if, if it's not shared, but actually it's harder to cross the grass. You know, so it's, you know, so um, there was very little vegetation, there were no trees, you know, and maybe if you took out every 10th car and put a tree, like you could start to imagine, like you could negotiate, okay. Yeah. You know, I guess, the, is there one street sunnier than the other? Um, I mean, what, you know, you could maybe make the sunny or the evening sunny side of the street generally in the afternoon and evening when people have more time, if there was a wider pavement or wider sidewalk on the sunny side of the street, that would maybe make sense. And if you, if you do this as a community project, because I mean, this is what I, this is my, a lot of my jobs are like this, you know, it's like some really boring street, come change it. And the people are really conservative because they want to park their car at the door or the shopkeeper wants to pe people to park at the door. But then you say, well, you know, maybe if, one car space, one car space, that could be like 15 people sitting. Yeah. One parked car empty or 15 people sitting. If it was a cafe, that's like, that's one or two people's jobs. 
you know, that car space could make money. It could make, create employment, you know? And I think you have to kind of give these little examples and say, okay, two parking spaces, hmm. two parking spaces. We could have like a cafe, 15 people, two jobs and a play space and a tree, yeah. you know? And you could kind of demonstrate and take people on the journey. And I think probably the, the, the most, I mean, because it's really hard to persuade people I think the most successful thing we, we, we've done, and it's not in the book, is doing pilot projects, doing a temporary intervention. So you say, okay, for this summer, for three months, we're gonna make a temporary thing. We're gonna put a little cafe in two parking spaces, only for the summer, don't panic, it's only for the summer. And then you can do this test and give people an experience. And so, I mean, in New York, our, our, our most famous project in the office is, um, is Times Square and Broadway in New York. And that was a temporary project. And we painted like, we I mean, it was like a joke, like Broadway, we painted the street, like the red carpet, we painted it red and we put temporary furniture and we closed Broadway temporary. Mm. And it was eight years of temporary. And it took eight years for the city to have confidence to say, actually, this works. This is nicer. It creates more jobs. It creates a better atmosphere. Um, the, the shops get more customers. People are better behaved. There's less crime mm -hmm. because there's more life on the street. The, the police can tell us there's less crime. Yeah. And so a big thing what we do is, I mean, the data, collecting data about the change, you can then demonstrate, okay, this or this. And then the politician or the journalist can then explain, well, you know, like, of course, we're not going to change it back because this and this yeah. and this working better so it's about making bold choices sometimes yeah mm. yes Leo, but, i know you have also something yeah, about please. the whole car uh, cars in the city yes uh, i i mean I, I totally agree but uh, um but but we also have to acknowledge that the car is is so important in our society in a as a as a means to show our status mm. and um neglecting this uh, and saying okay we have to move the car out but you have to find an, a solution for that feeling that the human has so i was really wondering how do you think about that well i mean i i know this because i mean okay i mean i come from a, a working class family or historically working class my dad left school when he was 14. so for my dad like the whole aim of life was to have a car he, my, my father was the first car in the street you know, in the 1950s, kind of like he was the first one to have his own car. And for my family, the car was like the center of everything, living in a detached house, you know. And what was really weird for my father, for, for like um, the son, the, you know, my sister, we were the first ones to go to university and get educated. And we, and we live in apartments in the city. And, I, you know, the son doesn't have a car. And my dad was almost so desperate. My dad wanted to buy me a car just so you could tell my friends I had a car. And there's something about like, as you progress in life, you discover that actually sometimes as your life gets more sophisticated, you need less stuff. You'd need less things and you know, you can live better. And eventually my dad understood that actually my life where I could walk to things was actually more efficient and more enjoyable as well as being cheaper and more energy efficient than the life of having the car and parking the car and then driving the car and finding a new parking spot. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a process of education and learning. Um, I think there has been a big shift in popular culture. Um, I guess in the eighties and nineties, all of the sitcoms were always like an American family in a house kind of in the suburbs. And then something happened with friends and Seinfeld and sex in the city. And suddenly everybody was in an urban environment and all these Americans didn't have cars. And that was a huge shift in popular culture that suddenly that the most famous American people on television were not on, in cars every day. And I think this kind of like learning of seeing the example of how to live your life because you can't imagine it. Um, and you just need to see lots and lots of examples of it. So, and, and, and demonstrate it being, being the more sophisticated thing. So it again comes down to one catering different needs, but also on the other hand, 
that we as people are f flexible and can change our behavior yeah. as well, what we wanted yes. at a certain yeah, we, point. We, learn, we can learn, we can learn, and we're constantly evolving and learning. Yeah, but uh, what, what I miss in this is, it's about also about comfort. It's, and, and time is also part of comfort. If it takes me 15 minutes by car to reach to my office, and it takes me an hour and 15 minutes by public transport, or an hour and an hour on my bicycle, um, I gain about an hour and a half by using this car. Yeah. Um, and I, it's true for a certain group of people that, yes, um, they see the advantage of the, uh, but still if you look at the CEOs of big companies, most of them have a car. And most of them don't have the smallest car. So mm -hmm. um, yes, I, 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 I do agree, it's about, it's about educating, but it's also about finding, uh, making sure that you can offer an alternative that is at least as good. So if I could have public transportation from my house to, to the office that would take half an hour, it would be acceptable because mm -hmm. I have this time that I don't have to pay attention to the traffic and, and be, you know, maybe encounter other people. But, you know, the difference is too big. Um, so so I, th I think it's, it, it's, it's more complex than um, just, you know, um, realizing um, what the yeah. effect of it is. Yeah. No, th I mean, there's no, okay, first of all, I mean, there's no one single right answer. No. Mm. And we have to recognize that, you know, people are, I mean, okay, I mean, if I, if I was, you know, maybe knew you better, I would suggest maybe you should live closer to your work. <laughs> you know, you might think about that. Um, but that, that's a personal choice. I mean, there's a whole range of reasons why we make personal choices. And I don't think we should tell people what to do. I think we should give them better opportunities, mm -hmm. um, better ways to spend their time. And it's not going to be for everybody. Um, I think for the CEOs, I think we have to look at things like we have tax systems which allow people to have a car. For, I mean, like even in Sweden, which is quite environmental friendly. Um, if I buy a car, I can get all of these tax rebates for a car, like thousands and thousands of euros. I get back from tax because I buy a car. I get nothing for my bicycle. Mm. You know, the state will not pay for me to, to, you know, like they won't give me 10 euros because I pay the, I, I cycle my bike to work. Yeah, so it's again, like this, the systems. Yeah, so there are systematic things that we yeah. need to look at, you know, and, um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very unfair that we make it very, something's very easy and we, we invite that. Mm -hmm. And then other things, you know, you, know you, you make, you make it a harder choice. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's things like, should there be more free transportation? Like if it was free, you know, free to take the bus, you know, or if you, were, you could tax deduct your bike off your taxes. Yeah. Well, there is a whole new, new generation uh, here. So I also have to be a little bit mindful about the time, but uh, we have a whole new generation here that is uh, gonna design our future society. So maybe we could give them some, uh, some of those questions and they have to solve all the things that we did uh, we, we did wrong. I'm sorry, no pressure. Um, but is there anyone that would like to uh, uh, add something to uh, what you have learned or where you wanna uh, focus on and use the books of the skills you learned with Soft City uh, on uh, in, in your next career or in your uh, study? I see Short raising, raising a hand. Actually, it's a really small question about the conversation we sure. just had, if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, it was about the status of, of having a car and you want people to change to public transit. Uh, do you have maybe an idea how we could implement this status feeling or, or craving into the public transit? I mean, people do want the bigger car and the bigger car than their neighbor. How can we uh, use this in public transit? Do you have an idea or a starting point? Any of you? I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, well, I, I was hoping you, you would have an. I was really hoping you would have an idea. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it's already changing. I mean, um, I think, for example, having a. I mean, already there's a state just having really good bikes, mm. and like I mean, actually in Scandinavia, if you got a good cargo bike, it costs the same as a car. So people are actually there's like high end bicycles, you know, high end cargo bikes. So I think you can make those things um, attractive. I think there are other factors too. I mean, a big thing happened in, in Denmark 
three, four years ago, they did a study about children's academic performance. And they discovered that children that walk and cycle to school have consistently a better academic performance than children that come to school by car. And they did the ratio, this is across all societies, not just rich families. And so, I mean, in a way it's common sense because the kids who walk and cycle to school, they're like, they come to school and they're awake, you know, and they, you know, they're, they're ready to learn. And the ones that are in the car are kind of like half asleep and stressed because the parent driving the car was like shouting in the traffic, you know. And so, but that really changed the middle class outlook because suddenly for the middle class in Denmark, um, it was not, it wasn't respectable to drive your kid to school because you were a bad parent because it was connected to something else. So I think we sort of mean, maybe some one thing is you can connect the question to something else, which is important. Yeah. And like having smart kids is also status. I mean, that was just one, you know, like one example. So is it, and that's maybe on the education thing. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, do you have a driver's license? Yeah, I, I do. I do. I don't have a car. My parents sold the car, so we're doing a good job. I don't know. I'm just thinking about public transit and make it more appealing. I think we still do have still like two classes in the Dutch uh, uh, train, which is a bit weird, but it, it's still like a separation between a higher or a lower class or whatever. So in that way, it's weird. On the other hand, you do want to nudge people into switching to more greener yeah. options. So yeah. that, that's I mean, the hard part, I think, here. I mean, I, 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 I guess, okay, I mean, there's nudging, I guess, um, improving standards. Um, and it's very different from country to country, the standard of public transport. Um, often Dutch, I find that the Dutch trains are a little bit plastic, kind of like a lot of hard surfaces to keep them clean. Uh, other countries, there's more, more carpets and soft materials. I think internet availability has really changed things. I think this idea that you, if you've got good internet on the train or on the bus, um, it means you can do other stuff while you're traveling. So that changes the value of your time because I mean, in the car you have to drive, whereas if you're, you know, on the on the on the bus, on the tram, on the train, if you've got good internet, you can be working, you can be reading, surfing, you know, you can have your own music, your own sound system with you, so that that can make it more comfortable. The only thing I'd say in defence of the first class, if we can get more rich people, more CEOs, <laughs> on those people to take the train, that's a good thing because you'll see them on the platform. Um, the best thing I've seen maybe for changing those things was in Freiburg in, in Germany, um, you know, this super eco town. They have a cycle center in Freiburg and they have valley parking for bicycles. For bikes, okay. <laughs> yeah. And so the rich guy who's, go who's going to the bank in Switzerland, he cycles to the station and he like, he hands over his bike and his raincoat to like some guy and then he goes in his little leather briefcase to the state train and while he's away somebody will clean his bike they'll hang up his raincoat and he'll come home in the evening and they'll be waiting for him and I thought, that's great and he sold if his car more like really rich people to cycle and take the train that's that's fantastic yeah. i don't know well thanks uh, thanks short is there anyone else with a last question that uh, needs thought, to be addressed today? Or a thought or an idea? Yeah, I see Sam. Um, Hi, Sam. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Hi. Hi. Um, I found it a really, really nice book. Uh, and I have a question. I was curious, what do you think about uh, mixing people with different cultures uh, or... Uh, uh, a socio-economic background into building blocks uh, to do that. Um, how do you say it? Um, well, that, that, yeah, that's so, a great so question. Should we, just, should we just take another half hour to talk about this question? <laughs> well, you have two <laughs> minutes. <laughs> no, you've got a, it's a really good, it's a really great question. And I think, um, I, I don't know if I've got a, a really fast answer, but I know we're coming to the end. So I'll try and do a kind of a rounding off thing here, which is maybe answering the question a bit. Um, one of the best things, I mean, I, I think traveling is fantastic, being exposed to other cultures. And I guess when you travel, you choose you choose to get exposed. Um, and one of the things I've been doing is I've been teaching in a Japanese university. And I was part of a seminar series called 
measuring the non-measurable because so many of the things we love about the city um, are hard to measure. You can't put it on an Excel spreadsheet. And there's a wonderful Japanese professor, and I don't remember his name, who's researched happiness. Hmm. Like, how, I mean, you know, Japanese people, they, they're the longest living people in the world and everything. So what makes them happy old people? And he had three key factors for a happy life. Number one was meaningful work, purpose. Like having a reason to get up in the morning was really important. Maybe that makes sense. Number two was curiosity. Lifelong learning, the ability to learn new stuff, to change your opinion. And the third one, which I think is the most interesting one, is diversity of acquaintance. Diversity of the people you know in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, economic background is one of the most important factors in happiness. It gives you perspective. I mean, if I go to dinner with a whole load of like 50 year old male white architects, I will go home feeling like a loser because everybody's got a more beautiful partner, a bigger house, a bigger car. Like you, you, if you compare yourself with people who you feel you should be like, it just makes you feel bad. And I guess that's like desperate housewives and all that, all that kind of stuff. But if you know lots of different people, like you know, people who are just starting out in life, people with a different background, people who are richer than you, poor, it gives you perspective. It gives you amazing perspective. And the example I was given was, for example, like the, there's a guy who's like cleaning the shoes of some millionaire who's talking on his phone. And it's his regular customer, so he knows the guy, you know. And he listens to the way that the millionaire like speaks to his children or his wife on, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, you know, on the phone. He's like, wow, like he's really rich. But actually, I have a much better relationship with my wife and my kids. Like, imagine the way he talks to his wife, you know. And I think those insights into other people's lives can really help us because, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing so badly. You know, people who are, I mean, people who you imagine are much better off than you are actually maybe not that much better off. And then you can be inspired by people who actually are really struggling, you know. People who've newly arrived in their country, they're struggling economically to find work, to fit in. You know, people with illness, um, as people get older, the challenges they have. And the more you're exposed to that difference, it makes you more tolerant, but it also helps you assess yourself and place yourself in society. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my kind of answer to why, the, if we can explain the advantage of being more different people yeah. closer to each other. Leongo, do you have an addition to the answer to Sam's question? No, I think I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and you know, it's um, getting to know more people. It, it, it makes your perspective broader uh, and, and it, it, it enriches you. And that is what we have to realize, that no, getting to know other people doesn't take anything away from you. It, it, mm. it only brings you new things. And, and, and that, is, that is what we have to... Yeah, we have to spread that word because we are so afraid that someone that looks different or uh, behaves different will take something away, away from, from you. Us, yeah. yeah, but yeah. You, you are always there, present, to stay the way you want to be, and the other can give you some extra if you are willing to to acknowledge the yeah. other person. Again, so, uh, it uh, makes yeah, so much sense, right? Yeah. Sorry, I know we're running out of time, but a simple example is I think about using like if you can change from taking the car. I'm taking the bus. Like for my mom, for example, um, she used to go in the car everywhere with my dad. And when my dad got older, he couldn't drive anymore. And suddenly they were forced to take public transport, like for the first time. And actually it changed their lives because they started meeting all these people on mm. the bus. And actually they quite liked it because it was really interesting and they had time to speak. And they were exposed to people who were a bit different. And like, and then once you step outside your comfort zone and you survive, you become quite proud. And then you can start showing off like, you know, like, well, my, my mom, like, yeah, I know some lovely Turkish people, you know, and like, you know, and like I met them on the bus and kind of, and then if they have these conversations, they feel empowered because they feel in control. I can deal with the difference. I can enjoy it and I can show off to my friends that I'm so much more multicultural than you. And so I think being in a, in a society with places that allows us to be exposed and very gently to be coaxed 
to step out of our comfort zone and find out it's actually quite nice. Yeah, so it's again people to people. Yeah, yeah totally. Okay, to um, go a little bit towards the uh, end, because I know you've been an educator for many years now. Um, well, you just mentioned uh, teaching in Japan. I also know you're uh, teaching at Lunte School of University. Um, I know that you once met Jan Gill when you were a student uh, yourself and he inspired you to actually continue uh, working on uh, working in architecture or studying architecture. Um, so I was wondering, I bet there are people now that are listening to what you are saying. Like we, we are listening to what you're saying, but you also have people in class. What would you like, the, fast forward 10 or 20 years, what would you be reminded of as in what would they want to like you are talking about Jan what would yeah. you like them to say about you okay that's a really good question okay first off very quickly I was I dreamed of being an architect when I was a kid I was going to architecture school and then when I got to architecture school I was so disappointed because it was nothing like I imagined and I imagined making a better world and it was so pretentious so when I was 19 I was in the second year of architecture I was ready to drop out and I heard these lectures by Jan Gale, and it made so much total sense. And I say, if you don't know, like read, read Jan Gale's books. There's um, Cities for People, Life Between Buildings. Jan's really interesting too. So that's, so meeting a hero is fantastic. Um, and Jan inspired me to go from Scotland, I'm Scottish, to go to Scandinavia. I studied with Jan and, and I, I'm now working there. So I would say, follow your heroes. I mean, saying that, Jan never liked me. <laughs> I wasn't his favorite student, but I kind of knew the direction I wanted to go in. And I, I was going to tell you, maybe I, I thought I had a little story. Yeah, and we have a picture of it too. Yeah, and so I can maybe share my screen. Now we have the screen. picture. You've got the picture? Yes, I have. Wow, okay. Well, um, a couple of years ago, uh, well, I was like 10 years ago, I was in Christchurch, New Zealand after the big earthquake which destroyed the city and i had a project which was to rebuild the city center so i was living in new zealand for three months making a plan consulting with the public um and that's what there is consulting with the public and one of the things we did was to get everybody involved and people had lost their homes um you know they'd lost jobs so it was really like can we inspire people to to um to imagine uh a nicer future for their city and amongst other things, we did these Lego workshops. Of course, Denmark, we do Lego. Um, we did Lego workshops and we asked children to build things. And so build the environment you'd like to live in. And there were lots of different projects. And, some, and most of the kids, they built like um, skate parks and play, play parks and like funny things. Um, actually, one, one, one kid designed a disco and a pizzeria. But one of the ones, the one I always remembered was one kid actually designed uh, a factory because his dad was unemployed. He wants to make jobs. So he designed a Marmite factory and that's a very special New Zealand thing. This brown stuff that comes in a jar. Well, I think some of us know it too here. <laughs> you know it? So, um, but he made a Marmite factory because he thought that that would make a job for his dad. And I thought this was just really nice. And I, I took a picture of it. I sometimes use the picture in a lecture. And then something amazing happened because um, just like two weeks ago, I got a letter, uh, an email. And I was like, hi, David. You probably don't remember me. My name is Elliot. We met 10 years ago in Christchurch, New Zealand, when you were working on helping design and rebuild the city after the earthquake. I was part of a Lego workshop for getting the public's ideas. And you talked to me about my Marmite factory and how impressed you were with it. And you told me to get in touch with you when I was older to talk about the design and a future in the industry. Well, here I am in the first year of design at Victoria University in Wellington. So amazingly, the 10 year old kid and actually in the photograph I discovered in the first photograph, there's the kids playing, it's the kid in the blue t-shirt, it's actually Elliot, he recognized himself. And, and what was amazing was Elliot didn't have a photograph of his factory. So I was able to send him the photograph. And now he's doing a little project about this at school. And actually my office is doing a project in Wellington. So we're now getting a kind of little internship going for Elliot so he can be part of that. Okay, that's so really cool. It's amazing how a small thing like one of 
a hundred kids doing a Lego workshop, and um, he's now he's now having a career as designer. So that's so this is an invite to uh, all of us to contact you in a year or ten, yeah, yeah, right? Sure, fine. <laughs> yeah. And just so you know, um, I'm not the one who gives the jobs in the office. No. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. But, well, but, maybe but, you, you know, don't have to wait ten years. And is someone here that wants to respond to that now? Is there okay. anyone that wants to add a final word for David? Well, uh, I, I can say, I mean, we, I can put, I can, I can give them my email. Any, I mean, seriously, I mean, diversity of acquaintance is great to meet new people. I'm always inspired by meeting my younger colleagues in the industry. So please get in touch. Um, if you're ever in Copenhagen, the very least will uh, will be I'll give you a coffee, um, and maybe something else. I mean, come by the office. You're very, very welcome. Get in touch if you're in Copenhagen. Oh, um, awesome. I'm so grateful for you reading my book. And maybe by the time you, the pandemic is over and you can travel to Copenhagen, there'll be a lot more things to talk about. Yeah, well, I think there's already one person that wants to respond to that because I saw Stella raising her hand. Okay. Yes. Stella. Hi, Stella. Hi. Hi, David. Thank you very much for sharing the book. Um, I actually had one more question, but I think it's kind of a broad topic. And I feel like we're running out of time. So I was wondering if I could maybe send you an email with the question. And of yeah. course, please do, please do. Yeah, uh, well, we actually discuss the topic in that sense. We we will we will uh, connect you to uh, to uh, to Stella, and Stella. I think we're gonna send you all the uh, uh, emails that or the questions that we have uh, gathered, and also the pictures that the students uh, sent us. Yeah, I really love the pictures, and I'd love to see if there if there are more. Please send them. Yeah, yeah, well, then you can respond to that. So this isn't finished yet, but we are going to wrap up this session. Um, so I do want to thank all of our students for uh, joining. And uh, I hope you got inspired by uh, hearing uh, David and Diongo talk about uh, this. Um, Diongo, some final words from you, maybe, before I say goodbye to you? Uh, well, it, it was an amazing evening, and uh, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from David again, and also from the students, what they brought in, their examples. And, you know, the, the best thing is to, you know, when you read a book, if you can apply it. Um, and, and what I would like to share with the students is please walk. Please walk the cities. Please walk the places where you are going to design because yeah. we have Take all these time to look at well, things. Yeah, yeah. But not only look because that's the nice thing about walking is you, you can use all your senses and we can get everything from the computer now. You know, you can get the aerial photo, you can get a walk uh, walking, but feeling the place is much more than just uh, seeing the visual of it. So, um, yeah, that's what I would like to, 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 to take away, to, to give away mm. to the students. Mm. Please walk yeah. when you, before you design. David, totally, totally. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> David, and, and I guess this this is the softness. This is the soft. It's being a human being, using the senses, the sensual city that you that you smell a city, you hear a city, you touch it, and sometimes you taste it. And and of course, it's the, the encounters with other people, observing other people using the city. I mean, and that's the best school you can go to. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David, for uh, so taking much, the time you. to join us this uh, evening. Um, this is not the last conversation we had, already know that. But uh, thanks for uh, being, uh, being here with us. And uh, for everyone who has been watching uh, the live stream, uh, didn't have got the book yet, but got inspired, please buy it with a discount that we have, DCFA. 2122 at Ateneum Bookstore and uh, join some of our live cast because we uh, uh, are not finished talking about this subject yet. Uh, next Monday, we have another uh, live cast in the series of Designing Cities for All, uh, the Ident City, and then we're going to talk with Francine Huber, uh, Aminata Cairo, and uh, Ronald Snyder. So I'm going to, I'm really looking forward to that one uh, too. So everyone Francine can join. Francine is fantastic. I love Francine. Well, she, join she, us she, she, next she Monday. Was all, she was all, I, I've worked. I worked a little bit for Francine when I was newly qualified. She's such a hero. She's the best. Well, you you are sharing the same stage here, design at designing cities for all. So that's uh, that's awesome. But join us Monday then. I see you then. And okay, um, um, what I wanted to say is uh, um, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we will see you uh, next time.